this webinar, Silence of Western Feminists Amid a Genocide. My name is Khadija, and I'm the International Advocacy Officer at Muftah. I'm joined today by two brilliant academics, Dr. Tunabi and Dr. Jabari, who will be speaking today. At Muftah, we highlight the gender-specific issues Palestinian women face from the Israeli occupation. While Israeli violations affect all Palestinians alike, they affect Palestinian women in a gender-specific manner. For 172 days, Palestinian women have been facing the horrors of this genocide in a disproportional manner. Palestinian women are being displaced, tortured, killed, forcibly disappeared, and raped while the world sits idly by. We are horrified by the recent stories and testimonies of rape and sexual violence against Palestinian women by Israeli occupation forces during Israel's genocide on Gaza. Over the past few days, we have heard only a couple of what we expect to be many stories of sexual abuse. Palestinian women all over Palestine who are survivors of rape and sexual violence are hesitant to come forward due to the social stigma associated with such violations of that nature and the belief that Israel will just get away with such crimes, which they have been for decades. Despite the harrowing testimonies from healthcare workers and eyewitnesses, there, have been, there has been no international investigation no reporting of this in Western media, and inaction from prominent international institutions and, and individuals. The deafening silence of Western feminists and mainstream media in particular is deliberate, as opposed to their earlier outrage over Israeli allegations and, and misinformation, which has been used to justify this genocide. Si silence in the wake of these horrifying crimes is complicity. While it is becoming increasingly difficult for some international actors to continue defending Israel's genocide in Gaza, the very beginning of this war was justified in the name of women's rights. Historically, women's rights have been a key component in many colonizing missions. When the British colonized India, for example, it was under the pretext of trying to civilize Indians and impose European values while erasing Indian ones so that Indian women could be saved from harmful cultural practice such as sati. In 2001, America's invasion of Afghanistan to fight the Taliban was what the Bush administration would call a fight for the rights and dignity of women. Western feminists supported the war on Afghanistan because they saw the use of guns and missiles as a way to free Afghan women from the Muslim men. This logic justified a war that lasted 20 years, bombing the country and killing over 100,000. It is the image of the brown man who is barbaric and misogynistic that women need to be saved from in the eyes of the West. Fast forward to our current moment. At the beginning of the war in Gaza, allegations that Israeli women were sexually abused on October 7th was widely spread and used as fact before any actual investigation had taken place. These allegations quickly turned into policy internationally that supported Israel's war on Gaza, whether through arms political support, arms or political support, and it has led to the current genocide that we are seeing. The world was quick to believe these claims without an investigation because it fits into their preconceived notion of what a Muslim Arab man is. The dehumanization of Palestinians, which has also has always existed, has become clear with language such that describes Palestinians as savages, barbarians, and human animals. Yet, we did not see any outrage when Palestinian women for decades have been testifying against the sexual abuse they face in Israeli jails and at checkpoints. The Western feminists who showed outrage at claims made about Israeli women turned a blind eye about accounts of rape from Palestinian women, which have been confirmed by many UN experts. The story on October 7th fits with what Western feminists love most, and that is saving women from the brown man. Israel is committing the most horrific war crimes and weaponizing rape and sexual violence against Palestinians as part of its genocide in Gaza and the assault on the Palestinian people as a whole all over Palestine. This is the result of decades of impunity, preferential treatment, and lack of international accountability by the international community. Words have not been enough, and what is needed is action to stop this horror. I would like to hand it over to our first speaker, Dr. Suneda Tonabi. Dr. Tonabi is a distinguished professor in the Department of Asian Studies at the University of British Columbia. She is an internationally renowned scholar in the fields of critical race, post-colonial and feminist theory and politics, colonialism, globalization, and racial violence, and South Asian women, gender and sexuality studies. She is also a public intellectual whose academic career is grounded in the scholarship of engagement, 
particularly with regard to advancing the rights of women and co of color. We are honored to have her with us today. Um, Dr. Seneda, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you, Khadija. I would like to also begin by thanking everybody at NIFTA for organizing this session and for inviting me to be a part of it. Um, we, of course, are at this event today under terrible circumstances of the ongoing violence in Gaza. Um, how I wish that we had never, ever had to come together in this way. Um, this is going to be a very heavy burden to carry. Um, and yeah, uh, the Israeli attack on the Palestinian population in Gaza has been horrific beyond anything that words can describe. This will no doubt go down in history as among the most brutal of the colonial crimes of the 20th and 21st century, a crime against the humanity of Palestinians and also a brazen war crime. This event will also be marked as an attack in which the Israeli army directly and disproportionately targeted Palestinian women and children for extermination. The Israeli army has and is deliberately bombing and destroying the sites of everyday life, sites where it knows large numbers of women and children have been and still are seeking shelter. A feminist lens would of course immediately identify such violence as gender, an outright slaughter of women and children carried out systematically as a matter of state policy. Using a feminist lens also demonstrates that the bombings, the blockade, the withholding of food, water, medicine, the destruction of the healthcare system and of sociocultural institutions has deliberate and intended gendered consequences. I use the word deliberate because this is a calculated strategy of genocide. It is a strategy that has been clearly, publicly, and repeatedly articulated by the Israeli political establishment as being key to the realization of the state's genocidal ambitions. I make this point about women and children here, not because I want to discount or dismiss the violence being done to Palestinian men. They too are being killed, maimed, terrorized and traumatized indiscriminately in Gaza and across Palestine. We have all also seen the photographs and heard the words of the Palestinian men subjugated to gendered and sexualized abuse, to torture and public humiliation. The point I want to emphasize here is that Palestinian women are deliberately targeted by the Israelis for their own existence as Palestinian women, for their ability to reproduce and mother Palestinian children, and for their labor that links the present resistance to that of the coming generations. The point is that it is Palestinian women who, in their own survival and in their resistance to Israeli attempts to erase Palestinian existence, hold the family and community together. It is Palestinian women who, as has been the case in every single anti-colonial revolution, keep the spirit of the people alive and make sure to pass it on to the future generations. So the first point I want to emphasize here is that the mass violence against women is a central and indispensable element of settler colonialism as a historical phenomena. This is also the case with Israel. The violence against Palestinian women takes place in plain sight, but what it reveals about the gendered nature of Israeli settler colonialism, of Zionism as a political governing ideology, and about the genocidal practices in Gaza need to be thought through much more carefully. The reproduction of every settler society depends upon its ability to destroy the colonized people's power to resist and their capacity to keep on resisting through their future generations. Gaining control over the women is therefore crucial to this process and Israeli officials have made no secret of their intent to accomplish exactly that. To dismiss this declaration of intent as the ravings of ultra-right 
Israeli racists is to miss the point of how the dehumanization of Palestinians upon which the destruction of their people, peoplehood relies is the racialized foundation of the state and society. And this racialized foundation is in, inherently essentially gendered. Such racialized dehumanization focuses in particular kinds of way on breaking the body, labor, and spirit of Palestinian women. And this racial gendered concern is folded into the very structure of the Zionist state, into the very logic of its nation building, which is organized along apartheid lines. If a deputy defense minister calls Palestinians not human, quote unquote, a justice minister calls them snakes, quote unquote, who have to be exterminated. One finds such examples right from the Nakba onward. Such declaration of intent has shaped the context in which the objective that is being achieved on the ground in Gaza is the mass killing of Palestinian women and children. This is the context in which the UN estimated that 100 Palestinian women give birth every day with no access to shelter, clean water, painkillers, medical supplies, healthcare services. This is the context in which it is being reported that mothers are giving babies formula when they can find it using contaminated water. Mothers and babies are going hungry. Gaza in the, is on the verge of a catastrophic famine, warned the UNICEF many months ago. All children under the age of five are, it said, at high risk of malnutri malnutrition and preventable death. We see the effects of this today as Israel continues with the killings, with all the cruelty and illegality this entails. If these facts on the ground are known to the Israeli state and its military, they are not hidden from its citizens, including its women and its feminists. These facts are also well known to the Euro-American states who provide the arms and the political cover that are facilitating the carnage. This is well known to feminists in these Euro-American states. If we look at how the practices and the waging of the violence is gendered, Consider also how central gender and sexuality are to the misinformation and propaganda that has been produced by Israel and its allied states, repeated endlessly by their spokespeople and their media establishments. Stories about rape, mutilation, sexual violence, butchering of babies, etc., remain central to this misinformation and propaganda, which continues to be used to justify Israel's violence. Stories of women's breasts being cut off, of babies and children being burned alive, etc., are being used even now, even yesterday, at the United Nations Security Council meeting. Even after they have been publicly and repeatedly exposed, these stories are still being used to condemn Palestinians. The second point I want to emphasize is that if the Israeli state and army have organized the killing of Palestinian women and children, the majority of Israeli women have also called for, legitimized and supported the mass extermination of Palestinian women and children. This is a point that feminists need to urgently address. From Golda Meir, who was treated as a feminist prime minister, who claim there is, quote, no Palestinian people, to Ayelet Shafat, the justice minister, who identified Palestinian women as giving birth to, quote, unquote, snakes, to Siti Hotobeli, the Israeli ambassador to the UK, who even now denied that there is a human, humanitarian crisis in Gaza. Israeli women have played a key role in the genocide of Palestinians, of women and children. These Israeli women politicians and many, many others like them have actively disappeared the Palestinian people and disappeared Palestinian women from the political landscape as they have expanded the legitimacy of the Israeli state. In the process, we must not forget that these Israeli women politicians have carved out a place of privilege for themselves in the ongoing process of Israeli state and nation formation. The representation of these Israeli women political leaders as symbols of gender egalitarianism by Western feminists demonstrates another aspect of how deeply saturated with gender politics is the project of settler colonialism. 
feminist exaltation of Israeli women politicians advances their claims of Israeli and Western superiority, of Israeli and Western democracy, etc. The claims and representations go hand in hand with the feminist silence on the Israeli racial and political treatment of Palestinian women as the obstacle to the realization of the egalitarianism of the Zionist project. My third point looks at the question of what is at stake in the genocidal politics unfolding in Gaza. The stakes are high indeed for Israel and the survival of its Zionist structure and for the US and its imperialist power. For Israel, the intelligence failure leveled, which was revealed by the Hamas attack, the state's failure to protect its citizens, the army's inability to defeat Hamas, the collapse of the Zionist narrative of victimhood, and the full exposure of Israel's genocidal practices and the loss of international political support, all of this will be near impossible for Israel to recover from. It is also significant that this exposure of the Israeli political intelligence and military failures come after the defeats of the US-led alliance in Afghanistan and Iraq. These failures taken together call for a reappraisal of Israel's ongoing ability to destabilize the region in support of the US and in support of US Western domination of the region. These failures call into question Israel's ability to advance US foreign policy interests in the region. For the US, which was already an empire in decline, this moment is a moment of crisis as its foreign policy in the region is now in tatters. The popular support for the Palestinian cause has increased not only across the Middle East, but around the world. This support has upended the drive coming for the US for normalization of Israel's relations with the Arab states. Compounding the crisis, the UN has been shown to be utterly incapable of stopping Israel, of bringing about a ceasefire, or even of providing the basic needs of the displaced Gazans. Despite the best efforts of the United Nations, despite the absolutely vital role played by South Africa in trying to hold Israel to account at the International Court of Justice, and despite the strong consensus around the world that this carnage must end, the violence remains ongoing. Not only has the UN empire been weakened by the global war of terror and now by the war on Gaza, but the international institutional arrangements in place since the Second World War have now been exposed as powerless to hold to account the US Israeli-European alliance. So what do we make of the feminist response in this situation? It is striking to witness how difficult, different has been the Western feminist response to the violence in Gaza than to the earlier led US war on terror in Afghanistan. Western feminists have always been more interested in the violence done to colonized women by colonized men in this case, by Palestinian men to Palestinian women, then Western feminists have been interested in the violence done to Palestinian women and men by the Israeli state. This is nothing new. Colonized and enslaved women everywhere are familiar with these politics of feminist silence and or of feminist solidarity that directs greater animosity toward colonized and racialized men. Colonialism and racism have shaped Western feminist, feminist solidarities for decades, and the feminist investment in colonialism, racism, imperialism has long been confronted by indigenous, black, third world, and other women of color. But the contours of the racism directed at Palestinian women today especially revealing when comparing the siege of Gaza to the invasion and occupation of Afghanistan. During the 20 year Afghan war, the Afghan woman was constructed in media and public culture, as well as in feminist discourse as helpless and in need of rescue by the West. 
This racialized the Afghan Muslim woman as passive object, as oppressed by Muslim men, by her family, religion, and culture. The demonization of the Muslim man and Islam was thus the basis for the making of the Afghan woman into a quote unquote worthy victim. As many of us argued then, Western feminists made common cause with their states by working to save Afghan women. Western feminists played an indispensable role in gendering Islamophobia and in helping to advance the interests of their states. In contrast, Western feminists exalted the West as essentially oriented towards egalitarianism and hence essentially superior. The imposition of Western norms, gender norms and values onto the Afghan Muslim women thus became the condition for her salvation. Such collusion with the imperialist state offered Western feminists opportunities for their own advancement in the two decades of the global war. Important examples are the funding feminist organizations receive to develop reconstruction projects in Afghanistan, and also the political opportunities that were offered to feminists by their development of what they called feminist foreign policy for their states. We see a different kind of racism and Islamophobia at work in the case of Palestinian women. The racism of Israel has long been shaped by Islamophobic tropes and caricatures of Palestinian men as well as women as not even human, as demonic and hence as non-existent in political terms. This anti-Palestinian racism is compounded by the Islamic discourses of the war on terror that are now entrenched across Western institutions in law, in the university, and in the media. The, verging, the sorry, merging of Israeli propaganda with the war on terror's Islamophobia now permeates the governing practices, policies, and cultures of institutions across the West. So thoroughly have Palestinian women been dehumanized in the Israeli Western public discourses that their mass killing, even when reported live on a daily basis, has provoked nothing but censorship and retaliation from these institutions, including from the feminists who work in these institutions. Palestine, Gaza is of course a case of settler colonialism and like every other colonial endeavor, it is a matter of race. It is infused with racism. Gaza is also an issue of Islamophobia, which is presently a governing ideology of the West. On each of these counts, colonial genocide, racial dehumanization and Islamophobic demonization, Western feminist movements have turned their back on Palestinian women, on their resistance to the Israeli occupation, on their struggle for justice. It is the steadfastness of Palestinian women themselves, whether in Gaza, the rest of Palestine, or in diaspora, that is energizing the growing resistance today. Palestinian women are a critical force in the collective resistance against Israel, but also against the Western institutions that are making common cause in their efforts to silence and punish those opposing the genocide. We would do well to remember international law was not developed to protect colonized populations, nor was it developed to protect Palestinian women and children. Today, as the world bears witness to the Euro-American powers thwarting every attempt to stop the Israelis' defiance of international law, one sees more clearly than ever before the integral linkages between race, gender, Islamophobia, colonialism, and international law. Yet a new generation of women around the world is learning from the lesson of Palestinian women's resistance. For these women around the world, Gaza is now formative of their political experience and understanding. It is a vital lesson in how racial gender violence organizes the international law and shapes international politics and law. These women are also learning a vital lesson from Palestinian women on the meaning of resistance from Islamic as well as secular political perspectives. And in response, these young women are standing in solidarity. They are redefining the meaning of women's solidarity from the ground up and they're shaping their own activism 
by centering the struggle of Palestinian women and of Muslim women. Palestinian women have been the backbone and are at the forefront of the resistance. This is evident in Gaza today and elsewhere in Palestine. It is evident in the organizations, mobilizations of the pro-Palestinian women's movements across the Middle East, across the US, Canada, and Europe, indeed around the world. In opposing the Israeli state, Gaza is also today the front line against the US imperialist order and Palestinian women are at the forefront of this resistance. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Tobani. I think you know you you made the connection so clear when a Israeli official uses dehumanizing language against a Palestinian, how that quite literally has manifested to a Palestinian mother in Gaza being so malnourished that she can't feed her baby and her baby dies of starvation. It's like the the link has has never been more clear than I think now in Gaza. And like you said, this is historical. This isn't the first time. It's rooted in Islamophobia and it's been used in countless other wars. Um, so thank you very much. Uh, we will save our questions for the end. We'll have a, a Q and A. But for now, I would like to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Afaf Jabiri. Dr. Jabiri is a senior lecturer of Global Development Studies, the co-director of the Center of Social Justice and Change, and the course leader for MA programs, Refugee Studies and Conflict, Displacement and Human Security. Dr. Jabiri's research is centered around questions related to feminist theory, intersectionality, settler colonialism and women's agency and everyday practices in the context of the Arab region, with particular focus on Palestinian refugee camps, Jordan, Egypt, and Yemen. Uh, Dr. Jabiri, thank you for being with us. Uh, please, the floor is yours, go ahead. You're on mute, we can't hear you. Sorry, as usual, I forgot the mute thing. Uh, thank you very much for uh, having me and for the invitation to join this um, uh, discussion. And also thank you for uh, Sunira for her um, um, kind of uh, holistic and comprehensive analysis of what's going on in relation to uh, the genocidal war in Gaza and the gender uh, question and also feminist complicity within that uh, context. Uh, my speech is more specifically about the question of gender-based violence and uh, I want to kind of offer an analysis that I'm still working on it in relation to how do we analyze it from within the context of Palestine uh, broadly, but also more specifically from uh, within the context of the genocidal war on Palestinians uh, that is going on in Gaza right now. And I want to start with a question um, that was very clear from the very, that, that its answer is actually was very clear from the beginning, which is uh, uh, who are the women who are deemed worthy of protection? Uh, throughout the genocidal war in Gaza, it was unmistakable that Palestinian women were not regarded as deserving of such protection where Jewish settler women were. So gender basically manifested in every element of the genocidal war in Gaza and from the very beginning. The alleged accusation is just one example, but I will take this, this example in order to clarify the question of uh, who's worthy of protection and who's not from within um, 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 the uh, genocidal war. So the alleged accusation of sexual violence and the rape on October 7, which lack, of course, validation and evidence, and have been consistently used uh, for multiple reasons. But the first reason is to dis discredit resistant movement by associating uh, them with the groups like ISIS. And this in turn would enable the settler colonial uh, state in Palestine to associate also resistance movements with the war and terror narrative. And the second is to rationalize Israel's rights to defend itself by demanding revenge against every Palestinian in Gaza. So basically the sexual violence and rape uh, has been an integral component of the settler colonial state war propaganda against the people it has oppressed for 75 years and have served as a tool to both strengthen its legitimacy and delegitimize Palestinian resistance. While we are a kind of 
accustomed and familiar of how authoritarian and colonial state manipulating gender and sexual violence for their own gain. And indeed, these tactics have historically been employed against colonized and racialized population. What is truly shocking is the ease with which this narrative has embraced by feminist uh, by Western feminist, Western human rights organization, and also gender governance regimes such as UN Women, the Special Rapporteur on Violence Against Women During War and Conflict, and the Human Rights Council. The ease and swift acceptance of narrative propagated by a settler colonial and violent entity cannot be analyzed in isolation from anti-Palestinianism, which serve as a tool and method of settler colonialism. And anti-Palestinianism, I have used it as a theme for my book, uh, Palestinian Refugee Women from Syria to Jordan, to analyze the ways in which Palestinian women have been exposed to multiple forms of discrimination, first because they are women. In the backdrop of the genocidal war in Gaza, which where we can also apply this theme to understand, there are manifestations of anti-Palestinianism become evident in attempt to discredit the Palestinian narrative, first, by not contextualizing 7 October uh, and treating it as a separate case or inseparable from the ongoing 75 years of settler colonialism, and doing so, rationalizing the elimination policies of settler colonial state in Palestine. So when considering gender-based violence within the Palestinian context, it is crucial to recognize how anti-Palestinianism operate as a mechanism to normalize and justify the oppression of Palestinian as collective. And we have been here in the West and in, in particularly trying to show that anti-Palestinianism is a form of racism. And because there has been a deliberate way in linking uh, the question of Palestine to uh, as it, it's related to a clash between two religions, the anti-Palestinianism framework is very important to de-associate the question of Palestine from being a war between two religions and put it into the grounds that of the, of the settler colonial framework. So basically it's not as we uh, uh, oppose uh, the use of anti-Semitism as a weapon to silence Palestinian. We also try not to connect it to Islamophobia directly. It is like Islamophobia tries to silence people, but it is deliberate against Palestinian to uh, silence them, uh, to deny them uh, the right to narrate their, uh, 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 their narrative and expose them to a particular form of uh, uh, of racism. So but because uh, the disposition of the land and the effort towards their elimination are framed within the discourse that question their humanity and belonging to the land, which effectively placing Palestinians within the confines of an outdated colonial logic. So the terror narrative further serves to perpetuate this narrative, positioning Palestinian as part of an inherently other and a threatening world. So in this context, while gender may not be the primary analytical lens, it should not be disregarded either. It remains a significant category through which differentiation is established between various groups, them and us, the perceived good versus the evil, the civilized versus the uncivilized, and so forth. So it is within this framework that we witness the prompt and unquestioning acceptance of allegation of sexual violence as part of an important component of the ongoing genocidal war on Palestinian. On Palestinian. Another critical dimension highlighting the significance of gender in the context of this genocidal war revolves around the concept coined by Cynthia Inlow, the women and children category. And I must say that the perspective that uh, Sunira has put in her and in the speech is different than one, what I, because the way in which we differentiate between how women and men are targeted is important. But here I'm only thinking about the category, women and children, when they are put together, whether in Western media, whether in um, reporting generally, it's, it's actually within this framework, Palestinian women often find themselves marginalized, equated with children in terms of vulnerability, and hence qualifying for a protection similar to that provided to children. So the emphasis on portray portraying women and children as innocent, victims, 
perpetuate a narrative that overlooks their agency and autonomy. And on the other hand, men, regardless of their involvement in resistance, are often presumed guilty based on their gender association. This dichotomy reinforces gender stereotypes and further legitimizes the killing of Palestinian men while limiting the agency of Palestinian women as minors. However, the guilt by association is not exclusively gender. The narrative of the human shield implies that all Palestinians, by virtue of their association with Palestine, are complicit in all action, hence bearing responsibilities for their own suffering. Even when women and children are acknowledged as innocent, they are burdened with the expectation of serving as shields, suggesting that their worthiness as a human is conditional and their humanity is recognized only when it can be justified in relation to their potential victimization. Therefore, both gender processes and other othering mechanisms operate in connection to one another in order to perpetuate violence against Palestinians, which is important to analyze in order to expose the complex interplay between gender dynamics and border settler colonial system of oppression. And as this system also is connected to other capitalist, colonialist and racist system at the global level, and a link has never been clearer than what we see today between all of these systems together. The, the final point I want to make in relation to the ongoing discussion, particularly the last few days that we have been um, uh, within Palestinian context, I'm here discussing not within the, the, the West, particularly the question of sexual violence, and how should we talk about that sexual violence as Palestinians? Shall we expose the violence to show the brutality of uh, the occupation army to the world? And I know that the world has been witnessing a brutality that has never been witnessed before in recent history. But they haven't been They have not. There has never been a response uh, uh, about this kind of brutality. Uh, then why would they respond to question of sexual violence? So basically, what I'm saying here, whether our aim to expose sexual violence is only a relation to showing the West how brutal is the army, we will fail because uh, these sexual allegations, this, these sexual, uh, and the sexual uh, violence and rape uh, is not more brutal than um, running over the bodies of Palestinian men and women by bulldozers and the world witnessing that and doing nothing. And also, if we are uh, speaking to the West, thinking that the West will be appreciating sexual violence more than other form of, 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 of violence that has been perpetuated by the uh, occupation army, we are also mistaken. Because on the 20th of um, uh, February, and in the uh, special rapporteur on violence and sexual violence during war and conflict report, there has been a documentation of at least two cases of rape in the prison and multiple accounts of sexual violence have been uh, 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 have been uh, disclosed to the special reporter in her report. But again, we did not hear about these cases. It did not take uh, headlines of the Western media and it did not actually reach any anyone. And even because of the report itself, we discredited that report because the report in the first place came only to, in, his, in the first conclusion, it concluded that violent, sexual violence and rape took place during 7th of October, despite the fact that the, the report did not find any credible sources or survivors uh, of sexual and rape violence uh, uh, who spoke about that. So the report itself was discredited because it was not based on credible sources. But again, in relation to Palestinian, it was based on credible sources because women themselves spoke about sexual violence and Palestinian NGOs and different workers who were interviewed also spoke about sexual violence. But once again, the world did not actually take that. What in the in the press conference, the whole press conference, no question was asked about sexual violence against Palestinian women. The whole world was concerned about sexual violence against settler 
Jewish women because of this differentiation between who is actually worth of protection. That is a question I ask in my in my presentation. So if we are appealing for this audience, the Western audience, we will not find any ears. We will not find anyone to hear us. So why we are? And the second discussion is about that we don't need to speak about this sexual violence because it will um, it will trigger more fear among women and it will trigger people and or may, maybe it will uh, 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 it will encourage people to leave people who have been steadfast in in the north. So those like the two kinds of narratives or discussions that I have been. Uh, looked at whether it's through social media or uh, through some discussion among feminists. And I think at this time, we as feminists, generally from the global south, generally, because this if, if this is happening right now for Palestinian, it will be the same case if it will happen to any other women from the global, global south. I think at this critical, critical moment, we need to have that conversation. How can we deal? with issues related to sexual violence without first denying women their agency to speak about sexual violence, without empowering tactics of war and uh, war propaganda that might aim to really uh, um, uh, 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 kind of frighten people or force them to do certain things. So we need more awareness in terms of turning the sexual violence and rape that takes place within war and conflict as a political tool rather than as a cultural tool. What is happening right now in terms of denying the uh, voices of women who already spoke about rape within the context of uh, uh, whether in the prison or in Gaza, because of fear of ethnic cleansing or because of fear that families would fear rape and then leave, and that would make it easier for the occupation army to uh, uh, displace people. Um, that tactic would be used even more. <laughs> And that would then stop it. But what that mean, women would be more exposed to other, also to sexual rape and other more forms of violence. What I wanted to say that our discussion of rape and sexual violence should challenge the question of culturalization of rape and sexual violence within the conflict of war, because denying it, it means that we are blaming women. And also not denying it and speaking about it without having the involvement of women who are speaking about sexual violence and looking into the ways in which we can represent them without speaking on their behalf or without denying their, their agency. So we need to open this kinds of debate in order for us to think together as Palestinian feminists and also as feminists from the global south and feminists who are trying to decolonize knowledge in regards to gender-based violence and the question of sexual and, and, and rape within war conflict, we need to move away from either or kind of options. Just we need to speak about rape to expose the army or we need to deny it in order to protect people from being uh, 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 displaced or from fear of, of displacement. So how can we actually bring this issue of sexual violence without uh, without contributing into either of, of, of the choices? And I think we have more work to do after this ends. Uh, and I think now our uh, more, but this should start now because the the the, uh, 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 the genocidal war is continuing, and 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 those who would decide to speak, they will also need protection. So, how can we open this discussion? How where we can think of um, of involving women themselves, of involving the community, of involving and of making of making this as a Palestinian issue similar to other political violence. Why, when we see men are exposed to sexual violence, this is 
not sexual violence, like the uh, 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 ordering of men to take off their clothes uh, completely in front of other men or in front of their family. This is a form of sexual violence. But then when women men spoke about that, we didn't find the same discussion within uh, uh, within our um, uh, societies or within uh, uh, also feminist debates. And we didn't also link it to sexual violence because we are still thinking of everything that is related to sexual violence to be related to women. So my point here is that we need more discussion when it comes to sexual violence uh, perpetuated uh, either against men or perpetuated against women. And this conversation need to take place right now. And with this conversation need to be opened in a way that first, we are not afraid to speak about it. And second, we are also considerate to women and their agency when they want to speak. And also think of other ways when we think of women who decide not to speak about uh, uh, violence and find ways to document uh, uh, sexual violence in a way that can protect women themselves. And I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jabari. I mean, I know me and myself, uh, and I hope the audience as well would agree that we need to think more critically of how we talk about Palestinian women. We have to make sure it's in a way that doesn't strip them of their autonomy, of their agency, um, and doesn't perpetuate uh, kind of this image that uh, has been created of them because of the, the genocide. Um, so thank you for that. We will now go on to our Q&A. You can um, ask your questions in the chat. Uh, if I may, I would like to ask the first question. This is to um, both of the speakers. Um, so something I have been wondering is, and I wanna hear what you all think of this. Um, often when people talk about what's happening in Gaza, when they talk about the genocide, they first feel the need to um, condemn October 7th up until today. First, that's the start, starting with the condemnation of October 7th, and then they can talk about what we have been seeing since that is happening in Gaza. So I wanna ask you both, what do you think, what effect does that have on how we think of Gaza um, and how we are thinking of the genocide when we feel the need to start with this pretext first. And please, either one of you, um, if you would like to answer that. If you go, uh, Sudera, if you want to go ahead. Okay. Um, I mean, I'm speaking from outside. Um, and I, what is really striking to me is how um, there is no demand to denounce the Israeli violence. There is no demand to speak of what's happening in Gaza by putting it in the context of the long siege and blockade of Gaza of the historical dispossession, colonization of Palestinian people. In fact, my reading of this is that this demand to denounce Hamas works to obfuscate the historical nature of colonization. It helps to um, protect from view the historical resistance of Palestinian people since the Nakba, of which Gaza today is the latest instance, right? And so this demand actually, from my reading of it, is to severe what's happening in Gaza today with the history of the Palestinian people, with the history of Gaza itself, and with the conditions that have led to the confrontation today. So this demand to me is not an innocent demand. It is a demand that seeks to rewrite Palestinian history. It's a demand that seeks to erase Palestinian knowledge and understanding of that history. And it seeks to erase the historical resistance of Palestinian people before this current phase that's ongoing in Gaza right now. So for, my, for me, I'm really interested in what does this demand actually do, right? And this is what it does. 
So that would be my answer. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I'll just add to that. This is part of the victimology kind of uh, game that Israel has been playing from its inception, that they are the victims. And basically, you as a Palestinian always have to prove that you are not guilty and you are condemning yourself. So basically, when this is asked to a Palestinian, particularly we have seen seeing brutal, brutal interviews with Palestinians from Gaza, in Gaza, asking them before saying anything on Western media to condemn what happens on October 7. And the idea is not uh, to condemn or not condemn. The idea is not as a Palestinian, Palestinian, if you agree or not agree. The idea that is the starting point of every conversation, that you're guilty and you have to prove that you are not guilty as a Palestinian. And this is not in you. As a Palestinian, I always have, and we Palestinian generally, when we have um, conversation around questions related to Palestine, you come across question related to, do you deny the existence of Israel? Well, I'm from a, a, a village called Iraq al Manshiya, and it's the 1948 occupied land the existence of Israel is denying my existence. So why do you deny my existence? And I have always to confirm their existence. So basically there is no equal, and it's not about equality. It's about recognize, recognizing the injustice that has been made to us as Palestinian, while we cannot say anything about the injustice made to us unless we confirm our acceptance of this injustice. So basically the question of uh, do you condemn Hamas or what happened in the October 7, it's part of the same strategy that always try to put Palestinian into corner because you're guilty. You have to say that you accept what has happened to you. And sometimes it works for some Palestinian who have just want to protect their careers or those who are afraid or those who are trying kind of to um, um, really protect themselves because the, 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 the spaces for Palestinian are becoming really brutal. It's really difficult now to uh, operate in, in, in the West despite all of the solidarity that we see in the streets with Palestinian at the institutional level here, whether we're talking about academia or whether we're talking about media or anywhere, the spaces are really making it very difficult to exist as a Palestinian. Sometimes I feel like it will become a criminal to say that you are Palestinian unless, unless you confirm uh, or you say what they want you to say, which is basically to denounce yourself <laughs> and to blame yourself. Uh, so that's what, how I see it, as I see it, of a broader kind of strategy that has been used, but in, in every time it's used in different in different way and in different question. They will always find a question to um, uh, for Palestinians or those who support Palestine to question their uh, integrity, make them look as if they are not credible enough. Thank you both for answering that. I'll now move on to the questions in the chat. And for the audience, you can ask your questions in the chat or raise your hand and ask through the microphone if you'd like. But the first question, I think this is to Dr. Javeri. How do you define anti-Palestinian racism? I think that's in, um, that was when you were speaking, that question was asked. Yeah. Uh, well, I have a proper definition in my book, but for now I would say anti-Palestinianism is any form of racism that would deny Palestinians the right to narrate their history. It is to deny them the ability to speak freely. <laughs> it's this kind of a question, do you condemn Hamas or condemn what happened? Because it questions your integrity as a Palestinian or it questions your existence in the first place and your ability to speak freely and put you in certain situation. This is anti-Palestinianism. It is a form of racism that exceptionalize Palestinian, that make us an exception and make that exception normal. So the exception becomes the norm only in the case of Palestinian. In other cases, it's not. So basically, if you, for example, bring uh, 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 people from South Africa, Black people from South Africa who were 
uh, under the apartheid regime, uh, you never, it never occurs to your mind to bring a racist <laughs> from that apartheid regime uh, to be in conversation with them in order to have a balanced uh, conversation. But in the question of Palestine, no, they will always find there should always be a balance between what the Palestinians say and uh, what Israelis would say, because this will put them in equal position. This does not happen in any case. It doesn't happen in any other case uh, where the people who are under oppression are asked to narrate their um, um, narrative uh, in relation to the narrative of the colonizer or their own oppression. This is anti-Palestinianism. Anti-Palestinianism is to question our uh, demands for uh, for freedom. And, and here I'm, I'm thinking about freedom because freedom is much more than equality. We do have the question of equality, which brings us both as we are equal. We are not equal. We are under oppression. So even any account that would put Palestinian and Israelis as equal, that is anti-Palestinianism because they don't recognize the root causes of what's happening, which is settler colonialism that still exists as a framework to look at the whole Palestinian case. Um, so um, generally speaking, is any, um, again, um, denial of Nakba because that is a denial of Palestinian uh, existence on the historic Palestine as well. Um, another, for, uh, I hope I answered. No, that was uh, really comprehensive, thank you. Um, okay, the next question is for Dr. Tabani. What is your take on feminist foreign policy, which is implemented by several Western governments? Well, I think, you know, I mean, I'll give a very short answer. I think it is, you know, deeply invested in this idea that feminists share who've developed this foreign policy, that the West is more um, oriented towards women's equality, that the West has the capacity and the commitment to advance women's rights globally. Uh, and, you know, I see it very much as part of this kind of ideological formation of the West through gender politics. Um, I mean, of course, the, the proof of the pudding would be in the eating of it. And we've seen the feminist foreign policies of the states that have adopted it completely, completely unable to even address the issue of what is happening to Palestinian women. And for me, that is the proof of what this policy does. It helps shield uh, Western states by giving them the kind of, you know, um, uh, giving them the, the, the cover that they actually have a commitment to women's equality anywhere, including, you know, in the West itself, we know it's a sham. Thank you. Our next question is to Dr. Jabari. Is there a link between gender-based violence or domestic violence in Palestinian society and Israeli violence or oppression against Palestinians? Yes, of course. <laughs> like if we take the concept of the continuum of violence, uh, which is a very important um, um, uh, lens to analyze violence during war and conflict, but also under um, um, uh, a situation where settler colonialism exists. Um, this has been introduced by Cynthia Cockburn, and it's a very important lens to think about the relationship between what's going on it, uh, on, uh, at the domestic level as well as at the uh, uh, public level and during war and conflict. But in the context of Palestine, I also link that to the epistemic violence. The epistemic violence of anti-Palestinianism is a framework where, for example, when I analyzed the cases of gender-based violence uh, within the context of Palestinian refugee women who were living in Jordan, and because they were Palestinian, they were not allowed to enter legally in Jordan. So basically the families were living illegally in the countries and that exposed women to different types of gender-based violence within the households and outside of the household. 
But when women started to narrate their stories, their stories as Palestinian uh, for them did not start with the conflict in Syria. They always, women always go back to narrate their stories based on the story of their family, which means that Nakba is very important in terms of how do we think of anything that happened to Palestinians at, at the level of, uh, of gender or otherwise. So taking this lens in my book, I looked at settler colonialism and its technique of anti-Palestinianism as the first oppressive system that contributes into the uh, uh, marginalization of Palestinian women. But it's not alone. Then we have to look at the questions of nationalism in Jordan and why Palestinian in particular were not allowed to enter Jordan, although there was around a million of Syrian refugees. So the question of nationalism here was again very, very important. So I linked that settler colonial violence to Jordan nationalism to also global governance of refugees because those women, Palestinian women, were not allowed also to benefit from uh, the services of UNHCR and other UN agency because they were Palestinian and they were considered Onarwa as refugees. So again, here there are three systems. I go on and on in analyzing these cases because it's important to make connection between all uh, uh, oppressive system whether gender oppressive system that takes place within the family or outside the family. But also we need to have, when we talk about a case like Palestine, we never need, should lose the sight that the main issue for Palestinians, whether they are refugees or they are right now in Gaza, is Palestinian. Because they are Palestinian first, then because of their uh, if, if they are refugees or if they are national of other uh, 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 country, and then because of their gender. So gender might come first, might come second, might come third. Uh, third. But we need to have an analysis uh, that always link what happened in 1948. Uh, although even if we are kind of looking at violence that takes place against the third generation or fourth generation, because the impacts of the Nakbe is continuous. It's not as we see in the case of Gaza right now. It's not something that has never ended. Thank you. Um, the next two questions I'll ask together because they are kind of related and they're open to both of you. So the first one is how can we support Palestinian voices when some in the solidarity movement inadvertently silence them by ignoring or picking and choosing which voices represent Palestinians, both from within Gaza and beyond? The second one is how can we push peace organizations, especially feminist ones, to amplify Palestinian woman agency? And fortunately, I think these organizations has, have failed us. So please, yeah. either one. <laughs> yeah, I, I might take the question of peace because this is very important within the context of Palestine. And it has been for a long time assumed that peace means that people talk to each other. And this is wrong. <laughs> peace does not mean that people uh, uh, just need to sit down and talk to each other regardless of the situation. And peace does not come at the expense of justice. So basically when we think about peace, peace does not bring justice that is not peace. Uh, and in terms of organizations that focus a lot in terms of peace, um, there has been a narrow focus on bringing Palestinians and Israelis to be together or Palestinian women and Israeli women together and that would end the situation. There have been several initiatives that failed, failed largely because they did not recognize the unequal power relationships between Palestinians colonized, Israelis colonizer. And, as, and you can't even <laughs> negotiate and you can't talk and you can't really perform an equal role when the power relation issue has not been resolved. So peace that, that doesn't uh, bring the question of justice first, which means a solution to what has happened in 1948, 
a dismantling of the system of apartheid, the dismantling of the system of settler colonialism will not do will not change anything. And, and this has been um, um, tried before. Uh, uh, there were uh, um, initiatives with will, maybe with a good intention, but it's not the good intention. It's the good analysis, the good understanding of the situation. So basically, if we want some, um, uh, uh, if you want solidarity with Palestinians, solidarity should be on the basis of the dismantling of the settler colonial and apartheid system. There is no any way forward. Um, so I totally agree with that last point. Uh, you know, whatever one thinks about any particular Palestinian perspective, the objective right now is to end the occupation and the genocide of, uh, 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 you know, Gaza, but end the larger genocide of, of uh, Palestinian people. Uh, so I, I, I thank the, the person who's asked this question, because, of course, there are a range of perspectives amongst Palestinians. It's not as if there's just one voice or one perspective. And I think it's absolutely not the position of non-Palestinians to be policing which voices and which perspectives get heard and which don't. It's absolutely our responsibility to recognize the diversity of perspectives, the different experiences that inform those perspectives, and the different vision for liberation that are shaping those perspectives. And we can you know, build particular kinds of solidarities, but it is not the place of non-Palestinians to be policing that. And I think that you know, sometimes this debate can lead to a kind of you know, pull back from the commitment to end settler colonialism. And I think that that has to be the absolute core of our mobilization, organization, all the pro-Palestinian activism that non-Palestinians are involved in at the moment. Thank you. Um, so our next question. Recently, we've been hearing stories from the north of Gaza of women being raped, and my question is how often do women in Palestine feel free expressing, feel safe expressing their experiences of sexual violence? Last year, there was a story of a girl who was about 15 in the West Bank who needed surgery because she was raped so badly by the IOF, but these stories are ignored. Is there a way to make the Western, to make these Western colonial feminists have more accountability for all women? I know this. You guys have both kind of addressed this. I don't know if you want to add um, anything in particular. Um, oh, yes, I, I can. Even... Go ahead. Go ahead. No, 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 go no. ahead. Please, 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 go ahead. No, just shortly, and I leave it to maybe Sonira to add uh, again. The um, on the twenty, it's, it's it's very evident in the. Uh, really um, complete disregard of what the, uh, um, um, uh, the special rapporteur on sexual violence included in her report. Uh, again, that was the problem of the special rapporteur herself because most of the emphasis were on 7th of October, not on Palestinian women. And the cases of uh, sexual violence and rape in the report were kind of hidden and did not take headline. But anyone who would be interested in issues related to sexual violence and gender-based violence would have read the full report and would have seen these cases. But yet, these have not been reported on Western media and they haven't been reported by Western feminists. Let's take the case, for example, of honor killing. And if there was an honor killing case within the Palestinian society, this will go around in the world and will be on the headlines. Let's take if there will be a case within the Palestinian camps in Gaza, for example, this will take headlines. So again, the question of looking at the violence of the colonized as more uh, as a form um, they easily can relate to. They can relate to understand it because they already have the stereotypes about Palestinian men. 
and uh, being violent and being um, hyper uh, sexual and all of these stereo, uh, stereotypes about Palestinian men and also about Palestinian women being victimized and passive and will not be reporting sexual violence. We know that Palestinians have been reporting sexual violence. We know some of them have taken the sexual violence to the court themselves, but we know how the system works as well. And we know it's not only for cultural issue that Palestinian women are not reporting sexual violence. It's also based on the systemic denial of a justice system, the justice system that actually uh, can uh, um, uh, um, um, persecute them and make them defend them. Uh, uh, on, on their own in cases. So we can't uh, uh, think of uh, only that Palestinian women are not speaking. When they are speaking, they are not heard. When they are talking, they are not listened to as well. So, and this is part of the ongoing problem because they are not listened to. And I must say here, maybe also we have as Palestinian we, feminists, we have not really found the ways in the way in which we can deal with the sexual violence uh, that would make it a political act similar to any other acts of violence of the settler colonial states. So I will take up this question of accountability. <laughs> and I think the accountability has to be on the basis of confronting the racism, confronting the support of Western feminist movements for their states, for the you know, investment that they have in the idea of the West, in the idea of Western modernity, in the idea of Western superiority. That is the basis on which accountability has to be demanded. Accountability also has to be demanded for the power that Western feminists have claimed to speak for all women, to speak in the name of women, rather than take their own experience as a particular experience, as a particular classed, racialized, sexualized experience. And it is the, the, the uh, power to speak for all women that Western feminism has claimed for itself. That needs to be confronted and accountability has to be asked on that basis. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to ask the last question and then we will have to wrap up. But I would just like to point out what someone has said in the chat that the story from the West Bank um, referring the 12 to 13 year old was proven false. Um, and I think, you know, this is why we are always pushing when when testimonies when stories come out, there needs to be investigations, there needs to be, you know, some sort of accountability for stories that are true. Um, because, you know, obviously, misinformation, it's very easy to, to occur. So that's why we're always pushing for international investigations when it comes to this. Um, so the last question, how do we challenge the only white lives matters and no one else matters? whether it's men, women, and children of brown skin. How come we are not able to challenge those movements, those movements who claim progressive thinking? The international women movements are not supposed to be non-permeable. So where is the problem in your opinions and how can we mobilize to influence these organizations? Yeah. I can start and maybe, <laughs> I, I think it's uh, by connecting to other um, 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 causes by right? for example when um, black life matters uh, uh, started uh, they were confronted with the narrative of uh, all lives matter but all lives matter does not actually show us who are those who are more subjected to violence who are those uh, racialized who are the those who are still systematically discriminated against so basically if we are to challenge all these forms we need to build more connections between things that are happening over um, across the world and the case of palestine now is actually an opportunity to do so because the case of palestine is showing us how those regimes have been very skillfully been able to collaborate together and show that they do have this global war in gaza I and mean, it's uh, it's it's just, you know, sometimes when you think of this, are they serious when they are talking about their alliance against Hamas, which is a, a, a 
a resistance group, and we're talking about United States, and we're talking about Israel as, and, and UK and France, and those are very, very, very powerful states. So we have seen how the connection between those states is actually strong, particularly in these times. How do we as feminists really build that strong connection between us in all times? So it's not just, and how Palestine could be turned into a lens, because Palestine is a lens that would show us why, for example, now the questions that maybe Sonera has uh, brought uh, related to the intelligence, related to militarization, related to a new liberal uh, economic policies, etc. These are important. And how Palestine now as a case is a manifestation of the danger <laughs> is actually those uh, um, system are uh, 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 trying to uh, 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 trying to portray in the world as if it's danger on, on, on the whole world, while it is a danger on the few, the few, those who have captured the capitalist, uh, uh, new liberalist uh, uh, who control uh, uh, control the world. So there is a lot to uh, connect us uh, through the Palestine lens, through the anti-capitalism lens, through the uh, through uh, the anti-racism lens, all of these lenses are important and not one alone could solve the global, as Mohanty calls it, the global apartheid system. We live in a global apartheid system and this global apartheid system requires some um, a global collective act of, uh, of solidarity between us. Yeah, I think that we have to recognize that movements are already challenging and that movements have a history of challenging. It's not as if this kind of resistance is new or the recognition that we have to build solidarity is new. These you know, solidarities have been going on for decades, perhaps even centuries, right? If we look back at the anti-colonial movements of the mid 20th century, the alliances were there, our, hist our movements have their own histories. We've had glorious periods of working together in solidarity, in coalition, but we live in a time where these movements are being fragmented and they're being systematically mm -hmm. fractured, both by the policies of the state and also by the kind of lack of historical understanding of the movement of the moment that we're in right now. So I think it's crucial that we recognize that these movements are ongoing and even more crucial that we learn from the lessons of the past as we build our alliances stronger in the present, not attending to the history of our own movements and learning from the mistakes of the past, learning from the successes of the past is crucial. It's never been crucial, more crucial, I think, than yeah. at this moment, when if we look at it globally, there's a total failure of political imagination. This is a moment when that kind of learning from the lessons is so crucial. Thank you. I know I said that was the last question, but we did have one more. Okay. Um, so I'll ask this last one and then we will wrap up. How would both of you comment on the role of UN women, UN agencies and other international organizations amid the genocide? What was the first part of the question? How would both of you comment on the role of UN women, UN agencies, and other international organizations amid the genocide? Well, they have been complicit, in my view. Um, the UN women um, issued uh, two statements. Uh, in the two statements, Palestinian women were mentioned once, and everything else and the statement in, in each statement was related to October 7th. So basically UN women uh, uh, in the first statement, which was early on on the genocidal war on Gaza, uh, was part of uh, perpetuating that war and, and legitimizing it when they have started with allegation of sexual violence without themselves actually committing an investigation. And from the very beginning, we as Palestinian feminists have said, we need investigation. It's not just about like denying that this is happening or happened or not happened. We know if we work on gender-based violence, we should know that rape and sexual violence always about power, always. So basically, and we know that always we as feminists 
required to, ha to hear survivors directly and to hear from survivors directly. But when we hear it from authoritarian and, 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 and um, colonial states, and when we take that uh, very quickly and promptly respond to it by UN agency, this is complicity. And when the killing of women and uh, when the when the when the first statement by UN women issued, there was more than ten thousand um, uh, um, uh, Palestinian people were killed. So they they both all the Palestinians who were killed were not worthy of mentioning, but once in that statement, the second statement by the Secretary General of UN Women, Sima Bahout, was even more problematic because it came at a later stage and reconfirmed the allegation again and, and, and again without and putting Palestinian women and Israeli women on equal in equal side. So basically these organizations should be held accountable and responsible of what they have done. Then the sexual violence, uh, the reporter of sexual violence, I was in shock when I read the report because I know the person herself uh, and I know the, her work and I know that um, it was um, all the report says there were no credible sources. We didn't meet with any survivors. We didn't see any signs. We didn't blah, blah, blah. All of this, nothing, 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 nothing. But then the conclusion, there is a ground to believe that sexual violence and rape took place and is taking place. So basically she's even adding more mm -hmm. um, uh, and is taking place against the hostages. Mm -hmm. No evidence, not even one evidence. And I think she made the compromise by saying like also Palestinian are exposed to sexual violence. Maybe she thought that was a good way of, of putting it. But no, that's not a good way of putting it. And that does not justify uh, um, lie, basically fabricating and distorting facts. So the, 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 the holy question of the rape and sexual violence against settler Jewish women is exactly the same case used by the British against the Indian resistance during what they called the mutiny at the time, or in Vietnam by America, or in other contexts. Okay. So feminists should have been um, um, aware, because we studied this, we know this, that it happened in other places, and we should be more vigilant to how our um, position would be uh, uh, would perpetuate and be complicit in, in the genocidal war against Palestinians. The only thing I would add is that this is the reason that we need our movements to put pressure to expose the kind of class of feminist bureaucrats that has emerged since the 1990s to see how this mainstreaming of gender through international institutions, through institutions of governance, through state institutions at the domestic level have really used gender as an ideology, a technology of governance. And yes. it is for this reason that we need to keep building movements on the ground because those are the only uh, chances that we have of holding any of these Democrats accountable, of changing the policies of these institutions. It is by building these movements on the ground. Great. Thank you both so much. Uh, with that, we will wrap up. I'd like to thank you both for participating in this webinar. Both of your talks were very insightful and very beneficial for me and I'm sure for the whole audience as well. So thank you very much for, for being with us today. Um, to the audience, you could find our handles on Instagram, Twitter, or Facebook in the chat, as well as the emails for the speakers in case you would like to connect with them and follow their work and their research. Um, but with that, we will end here. Thank you everyone for attending and thank you again to our speakers for, for taking part. Thank you. Thank you for the invite. Thank you. Thank you.